Okay, now it's uh, 2.45, so it's time to start uh, this new session, which corresponds to the second uh, plenary lecture of this uh, 10th edition of the Atmos Conference. Let me give you a, a small organizational detail, which is that uh, all the recordings from the sessions that uh, were held uh, yesterday and Monday are now available in the triple site. So if you click on Monday, you may see all the recordings. So especially for the people who is in different time zone, uh, if they want to review what happened tomorrow morning, sorry, yesterday morning, they can just uh, watch it uh, now and tomorrow they would uh, be able of uh, watching what is happening uh, today or what happened today this morning and what's well, going to happen this afternoon as well. So uh, it is now my, my uh, great pleasure to introducing uh, the, the plenary lecture by um, uh, Professor Peter, Han Peter Hansbo. So Peter Hansbo does not need uh, an introduction, but I need to say something. So I, she doesn't need it, but I do. And uh, I would say that one of the main characteristics of Peter's career is uh, multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity in the sense that he has always uh, been oscillating in between mechanics, structural mechanics and applied mathematics. So this uh, results in his current category of professor in uh, computational engineering in, in John Copping or John Chopping. Uh, I don't know if I am able to pronounce correctly the name of the city, university. After being in different positions in Chalmers and KTH, eh? as I said, balancing between these two disciplines, more mathematically, more applied mathematics, more structural mechanics. So in that sense, he's a perfect representative of the Atmos community, because we all feel like a little bit in between applied mathematics and computational mechanics. So he's a renowned uh, researcher in error assessment and adaptivity, in discontinuous galerking, in fictitious domains, in methods for internal interfaces, and in particular, in the application of the Nietzsche's method to uh, as a technique to solve many of the difficulties arising from fictitious domains, internal interfaces, DG, and today he will, he will discuss the model coupling using uh, Nietzsche's method. So uh, please, uh, let, let's pay attention to this uh, around 30 minutes uh, lecture and then we'll have time for discussions with, uh, with him. Uh, please, can you play the video? So, Hello everyone and welcome to my uh, plenary lecture on model coupling using Nietzsche's method. And this is joint work with Erik Burman of UCL and Mats Larsson of New University. So an outline of my talk is the following. I'll talk about unfitted and cut meshes using Nietzsche's method. Then I will move on to a hybrid version of Nietzsche and then I will use this hybrid method to do model coupling in elasticity. So Nietzsche's method was uh, initially thought by me to be used to glue together meshes. It could be unfitted meshes as the mesh to the right, or it could be overlapping meshes. As you notice, when you do overlapping meshes, either you protect the boundary, like the upper picture, or you just cut together two geometrical objects, is that one of the meshes must have its elements cut. So we can think of a cut finite element method in which we do not mesh the boundary interfaces, we just cut the mesh. And uh, the example here is an interface. So at the interface disassembles the mesh and those me elements that are cut are have to have, have to have a duplicate. So you get two meshes. And then you integrate up to the boundary. And you have to introduce new degrees of freedom. And in the case that you have a boundary value problem, you use a background mesh, you remove all elements that are not intersected, you get an active mesh. 
and this active mesh, if you cut it, you get a computational domain on which you do your, all your intervals. So the problem for these cut methods and the non-overlapping methods are the same as a, a mesh-free method. You don't have any boundary nodes or interface nodes to set data. Uh, so we need a weak method for imposition of Dirichlet data and continuity on interfaces. And the method that we propose is Nietzsche's method. So if you never heard of Nietzsche's method, let me give you a simple example where you have a boundary value problem. So you have a divergence, minus divergence of A gradient of U is equal to F in omega, and you have Q equals a known function G on the boundary. So we assume that the mesh is not fitted to the boundary, and uh, we approximate on a cut mesh. So omega H is our discrete domain. So multiply by test function VH, integrate by parts, out comes the normal derivative, the co-normal derivative of U, multiplied by VH, which you can symmetrize by adding the co-normal derivative of the test function multiplied by U, if you counter that on the right hand, right hand side, because you know that UH should be equal to G. So you simply counter it on the right hand side, and then you add a stabilizing term, which is stabilizing because UH minus G divided by H somehow scales like the normal derivative. So this term is a stabilizing term. It has a positive sign. And you have to counter that on the right-hand side as well. And then you have a consistent method, because if you plug in the exact solution, this equation must hold. And it's stable because of the artificially added term. And it's symmetric because of another artificially added term. And this gamma parameter, which I will call the Nietzsche penalty parameter, must be sufficiently large. And you notice that material data is multiplied by gamma here. So gamma is uh, dimensionless and uh, typically chosen to be in the order of 10. Now, if we cut the mesh, we know that gamma must be proportional to the measure of the length inside the cut element divided by the area inside the cut element. And the area can go to zero, whereas the length does not, typically. So that means that gamma in a cut situation can be unbounded. This problem does not occur for interface problems, because we can always select the big part to take our normal derivative from. But the contribution to node n from the left side will be very small and conditioning problems will occur in all situations. And one solution to rectify this problem is to do gradient jump stabilization. So all the elements cut by the boundary are collected in a set. And across all the faces associated with this set, element size, we add the gradient jumps. Now, if uh, we have Poisson's equation, we assume that the gradient should be continuous. So this is a consi consistent term in that case. But it adds a sort of higher order diffusion, if you like. So it is a stabilization term. This is typically called ghost penalty. All right, moving on to interface problem. So omega is uh, intersected by an interface gamma, which divides it into two subdomains. We assume that we have zero boundary, boundary value problem, uh, boundary values, and uh, that we can prescribe the boundary as we usually do in finite elements. We're only interested in, in the interface here. So on the interface, we have to have continuity, and we have to have continuity of the co-normal derivative or the flux. So these are the conditions. And we have to have equilibrium inside the domains. So, And A, the diffusion parameter, can be different in the different domains, of course. 
So the classical Nietzsche method is you take a min value of the normal derivatives, some normal de value. Um, this is important that you can take any normal value because you can choose the large part of the element with a higher weight, and then you don't have this problem with gamma going to infinity. So you have the min value of the normal derivatives multiplying the jump of test functions, and you have the min of test the normal co-normal derivative test function multiplying the jump in solution. And you penalize the jump in solution multiplying the jump in test function. And again, this is the first boundary term is from integration by parts. The second you can add because the jump of u is supposed to be zero. And the third you can add because the jump is supposed to be zero. So this, again, it's consistent and stable. Symmetric consistent and stable. Now, the thing is that we can rewrite Nietzsche's method formally by introducing instead the means of test functions and, and approximations. And that means that we can do the integrals twice, one from the left and one from the right. So we, now do, we do not take means of the co-normal derivatives anymore. Instead, we use means of functions. Now, this doesn't seem to be of much use because it's the same method and uh, you have the same problems as before, but it suggests a new possibility. We can replace this mean by a hybridization variable. Let's call it u gamma h and replace the mean by that. And now we have a new unknown. Instead of saying, I know what this is, it's a mean, we say, I don't know what it is, it's a un new unknown and I put it into my approximation scheme. So we now seek three functions. One in domain one, one in domain two, and one on gamma. And we get a hybrid Nietzsche's method. So here is an example. We have a mesh with an interface. We have the cut cells. And uh, we can use either a lower dimensional approximation along the interface, or we can use high dimensional functions restricted to a line. It doesn't really matter. So the example uh, to the bottom left, here a single Q4 approximation was used on the lines, on a square covering the lines, the three lines, three squares, three lines. And the Q2 or P2 approximation in the bulk. Now on the lower left side, you see, there is no really difference between a standard Nietzsche method. It would be the same, basically, the same kind of work. And all you get is now you have a new variable. You don't really gain anything. But if you look at the picture on the right, lower right, you see that here you, you actually gain something. Because if you didn't have an auxiliary approximation, a higher degree polynomial, then you would have to compute all these intersections between different elements. And then you see the gain. You can use a polynomial on the interface. The intersection between a polynomial and all these elements is simple to compute, and all the integrals are simple to compute. And you avoid this uh, finding of intersection problem. So what I want to do now is I want to use this uh, hybrid idea in linearized elasticity. And I want to be able to introduce bending and uh, membrane stiffnesses on the interface. So let's first look at the hybrid method for elasticity. We have our equilibrium equation in the domains, minus divergence of stress equals body force. We have Hooke's law. We have an equilibrium on gamma, that means that the jump of tractions should be zero. And we have continuity of displacement between, between the approximations in the domain and the interface variables. And epsilon is, of course, the small strain tensor. And uh, the method looks exactly the same as it did for Poisson's equation, just with replacing it by traction multiplying test function jump between test function and the interface variable and uh, otherwise it's exactly the same so this is the hybridized method 
for linearized electricity. Now, I want to add bending and membrane stiffness. Okay, so we assume then that we are giving an arc length parameter on the gamma, on the interface, and a unit tangent vector along gamma. And this unit tangent vector is uh, assumed to create an orthonormal system with a normal n to gamma, where the normal n then is taken as, for instance, the normal to domain 1. And then we split the interface variable into a normal and tangential part. So we have two unknowns, but they are not Cartesian. One in the normal direction and one in the tangential uh, direction. And then we introduce bending and membrane stiffness by assuming that we have an euler bernoulli beam type uh, equation on the interface in the normal direction and a membrane equation in the tangential direction. And notice now that the jumps of stress in the normal direction comes in as a load in the euler bernoulli beam case, and the tangential part of the traction, the jump, comes in as a load for the truss. So this means that when we plug in these jumps, we actually get the stiffnesses the stiffness contributions from the truss action and from the bending action into our bilinear form. So let's, for brevity, write the bilinear form capital A of UB is the integral of the stress time strain plus EA du ds du ds and EI du n ds d2 u n ds2 d2 du n ds2, which is the truss equation and the beam equation. And in the right-hand side, we get contributions from the loadings, the tangential loading and the normal loadings. And then we have uh, approximations. We approximate the displacement fields in domain 1 and in domain 2, and we approximate the normal displacement field and the tangential displacement field on each uh, gamma. And then we have a new equation which contains the stiffness contributions, like that. Basically. We want to go one step further, however. We want to be able to model a cohesive coupling. So it's not a perfect uh, fit between the domain and the interface, but there is room for, for uh, discontinuity. So there is sort of springs on the interface between the interface and the domains. And the typical case is that then uh, the stress, the, ta the traction, plus some kind of stiffness times the jump equals zero on the interface. So the SI, they are coupling stiffness matrices. And we assume that they are on the form uh, normal normal stiffness times the outer product of m and n, and tangential stiffness times the outer product of t and t. So, in uh, usual finite element code, you would simply use this stiffness, and uh, it will give a contribution. However, if you want to uh, really take care of the case when alpha and beta can be arbitrarily small, so that the stiffness can be arbitrarily large, and you want to avoid ill conditioning, you have to proceed in another way. So we proceed by instead using a compliance matrix, CI. So CI times sigma dot m plus the jump is zero. And CI is simply the inverse of S. And now we can, we can put uh, alpha to zero, if we like, and beta to zero. And then we find that if we start by integration by parts, we get out the traction and multiplying the jumps, right? We rewrite this by introducing ci sigma b, ci times the traction of the test function which we reintroduce again. 
So what we have done here is nothing other than just a simple rewrite, introducing and then subtracting again the compliance matrix times the attraction of the test functions. And then we can add our consistent, consistent terms for stability and for symmetry. So we see that this is very similar to the standard Nietzsche method, only with one additional term. And uh, the tau is now a matrix, tau i is a stabilization matrix. And the idea then is that this does not uh, depend on the inverse of the stiffness parameters, but the inverse of the stiffness parameters plus h divided by gamma zero, the Nietzsche penalty parameter. So we notice that the parameters they tend to knit its original parameters as the compliances tend to zero, which is what we like, what we want. We want uh, to have Nietzsche's method in the case where the stiffnesses, it should be, tends to zero. It, no, when the compliances tend to zero. Sorry. So, either we have compliance and uh, the parameters are not Nietzsche's, or we have no compliance, and we're back at Nietzsche's method. So it's a kind of mix between Nietzsche's method and the standard method. The problem with the cohesive coupling is that uh, we have to enforce strong continuity of contact type if we have or to avoid normal penetration. So if they are separated, then it's okay. We can have this spring equation, but if they are compressed, they cannot penetrate. So we have to stop that by using a contact condition. This contact condition is only in the normal direction. So now we have to continue and uh, introduce the normal stress and the tangential stress, sigma n and sigma t. And we have the normal jump and we have the tangential jump. And then the contact conditions on gamma can be reformulated so that we have compliance equation in the tangential equation, in the tangential direction. But in the normal direction, we have kuhn tucker conditions. We have side conditions of inequality type. If we look at that, we see that the jump has to be negative on the boundary, meaning they have to separate, or, they, it, or it's zero. And then we have some other equation that should be less than or equal to zero, and then we should either one is zero or the other is zero. These are the contact conditions. And we recognize that one acts as a multiplier, one of these terms. And that's not just the normal stress, but also a term related to the compliance. This seems to me to be the natural extension of the standard a Lagrange multiplier for contact to the case of compliance. We then see that the kuhn tucker conditions can be replaced, completely replaced by an equivalent relation, that the multiplier is minus 1 over epsilon times the positive part of the jump in normal direction minus epsilon times the multiplier. And epsilon is an arbitrary number, a positive but arbitrary. And this comes, as I understand it, from Rockefeller in 1972. It's a very smart trick, but I had never heard of it, and I'm not sure it's very well known. Uh, you could argue that, well, what's the point? What's epsilon? How should we choose that? But when you use discrete finite element methods, it turns out that it's completely brilliant. Because this trick was used for contact by Schulin Hilton in 2013, and they made a specific choice of choosing epsilon minus one as Nietzsche's penalty parameter. So in the discrete setting, we have the answer what epsilon should be. And that made it possible to create a Nietzsche method for contact, which I think is the canonical version of Nietzsche's method for contact. 
And here we slightly modify their approach to take cohesion into account. I won't go into details. Uh, it would take up too much time. So, let me finish by taking some examples. I have here uh, five subdomains separated by six straight interfaces because I don't want to worry about uh, curved beams, so I use only straight beams here. So the data are that we have Young's modulus uh, 10 to the power 6 and Poisson's ratio 1 third in the bulk. And then I choose uh, Nietzsche's penalty parameter, which has to depend on the uh, material parameters to be 20 times lambda plus mu, which are the lambda parameters. Now we see that the normal is not directed in the Cartesian coordinate system, so for each of the slanted beams, slanted uh, interfaces, we have to make a tran transformation to Cartesian coordinates in order to ensure continuity in the points B, C, D, and E. So this is done by rotational coordinates. So for, for the beam equations, I use uh, C1 cubic spline, one for each segment. And for the membrane action, I use C0 linear approximation. Uh, and for the bulk, I use uh, constant strain triangles. Now the boundary conditions are that the displacement is zero to the left. And when I have beam stiffness, I also impose that the rotation is zero, at x equals zero. So, for the hybrid solution without interface stiffness, we get the, uh, with a vertical load written on the slide, we get a displacement field that looks like the figure to the lower left. This is no interface stiffness at all. So, having just linear approximations for the truss action means now that I'm in this case, using a linear approximation for the mean value of the solution, which is, of course, not perfect. You should use more truss elements, but this creates an artificial stiffness in the method, of course, but I thought it, it would be easier to use one approximation for each interface. So here I introduce bending stiffness. So there is no membrane stiffness, just bending stiffness. And I increase it, I put it 10 to the minus 4, and 10 to the, 10 to the 4, and 10 to the 5. I will see that the displacement decreases because of this added bending stiffness. I also add normal compliance. So to the left, we have a bending. Bending stiffness 10 to the 4 and a normal compliance of 10 to the minus 6. And if I increase the compliance a little bit, we see a dramatic shift in solution. It just lets go. And this is, of course, with contact conditions included, then, which you can see. And then we have a problem with stretching. So I have a load, body load pulling to the right, and this is the hybrid solution. There is no interface stiffness. We can see it looks about the same as a meshed method, as a meshed solution would look like. I then add uh, membrane stiffness. Now you can see in the left figure that you get some kind of slight necking because of this stiffness. But the interface is still curved because there is no bending stiffness. So in the figure to the right, I add bending stiffness. And now you see the interfaces no longer bend. And the whole thing is much stiffer than before. And uh, then I add a tangential compliance. So we have bending stiffness, we have memory stiffness, and we have tangential compliance in the figure to the left. So you can see that it slips along the interfaces. And to the right, I don't have a tangential compliance, but I have a normal compliance, and it releases the interface. And finally, 
we can add both normal and tangential compliance and uh, you can see that we are actually have a lot of freedom to model different phenomena with this approach so this was the end of my talk it was based on papers by Hans von Larsson, which you can find on Archive, it's not been published. Burman Elversson, Hans von Larsson and Larsson is published. This is about hybridized cut fan. And Burman Hans von Larsson, a cut fan attempt method for a model of pressure and fracture media, where you can find some more details. Thank you very much. That was my talk. Well, thank you for, for this talk. Uh, now, uh, Professor Hansbo is uh, available online to answer uh, questions and for an open discussion. So please, if any of the contributors is uh, willing to make any question, we have already a couple of them. Uh, Frederick Larson, I, I am going to read them for you, uh, Peter. I don't know if you are able to read them in the chat, but anyway, I, I will repeat them. What are the, from Frederick Larson, thank you for a nice talk, as, as I do as well, thank you. Uh, what are the restrictions or limits on the discretization of the hybrid displacement U gamma along the interface? Or should it relate to the meshes of either side? Finance courses. Uh, we don't hear you. No. no. We hear some noise. I don't know if there is a problem with the mic. Might be a problem with the microphone. Uh, Peter, to the right of the microphone icon in Zoom, you can see which device you have connected. See if you can change it to another microphone. Maybe the computer's microphone instead. Is this my computer's microphone? I have no other microphone. Sorry. <laughs> now it works. Now it works. Now it works. <laughs> so you can go ahead because yeah. now it works. Yeah. Okay. So uh, unlike uh, a Lagrange multiplier method, the hybrid variable it's not a, a saddle point problem. So you don't have this inf soup condition. But having said that, of course, if, if the discretization does not fit, because it's supposed to be in the min value, uh, or it represents somehow the min value of the solutions from the different meshes. So if, it's, uh, if it doesn't match, you can get a locking phenomenon anyway. So you ha it has to be rich enough on the interface to accommodate so that you can actually represent the min value uh, from either side. If it can't do that, if it's too coarse, then you can get locking. I've seen it in my computations. But other, other than that, it's a really nice method because it's, it doesn't require any soup condition. So, but when you mean fine, you mean fine, fine enough with respect to the, say, solid meshes at both, at both sides? Yes, yes. Or, or a high enough order okay, in yeah. order to be able to capture oscillations in the solution say, or something like that. Yeah, Frederick is asking, uh, can it be too fine? So I, don't think, I don't think so, because uh, in that case, it just adjusts to um, being the mean of the solutions on either mesh. And uh, there is no problem. But if you make it co too coarse, then somehow the, uh, the main meshes cannot accommodate with the mean, and then you get the sort of locking. Okay, that's good in the sense that uh, if you can overkill it, uh, then you're yeah, safe. Yeah, you can overkill it. There's no, there's no if soup. Okay, good. So, uh, Professor Ruben Sevilla is asking you, uh, can you comment on the relation, if any, between the hybrid niches method presented and the hybridized or hybridizable discontinuous galerking? Yes, they're very close. They're very similar. Some of these, there are different hybridized discontinuous Gilerkin methods, but some of them are, of course, the same. I mean, for sure. Okay. So, but, but uh, I, I, I assume that um, 
not in the in the, the physical uh, meaning of your uh, say uh, bending and, and membrane. No, no, I don't. I haven't true. seen anyone doing this kind of model coupling with a hybridized discontinuous Gilderkin method. I think it's only used as a, as a, an auxiliary variable representing somehow the mean. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, please, if there is any. Nobody else having to make any question, please uh, do it uh, via the chat. I have a, a, a one, uh, say, curiosity as, as a, say, a pioneering uh, person using the Nietzsche's method uh, to enforce uh, directly boundary conditions. So the simplest uh, application of the Nietzsche's method. Uh, what happens with the nodes which are outside the domain? Because uh, how? Do you throw away the information? Uh, do you you cannot throw away because sometimes you use them to 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 interpolate inside the domain. But if the nodes are far away from the interface, doesn't make any. They don't represent any physical value. Uh, do you have any? What they are the solution of what? Yeah, uh, you mean in the cut finite element method, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, what they do is that they, they represent somehow an extension of the solution. You could say that. That's the way we use it in the analysis. But of course, you need it as a degree of freedom to be able to solve a linear function inside the domain. Even if it's outside, it is needed to represent a linear solution. So if you want to, to say that it represents something, maybe you could, you could say that it represents an extension of the solution outside the domain. I mean, we, we also sometimes use uh, an extension operator, which extends uh, from the inside to these nodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then somehow it, it's clear that we are thinking in terms of extensions. Yeah, I, I have another question, which is actually a, a, a matter of personal interest, because we're dealing with a, pro with a problem in which uh, we, we are thinking on using this uh, niche approach. But the, the to speak, the problem is that the problem is not well posed. It's mm -hmm. a problem in which there is an internal interface in which uh, typically the, the end users, they, they enforce a directly boundary condition. But so okay. mathematically speaking, it's like dividing the domain into parts. Yeah, yeah. So you could, you could uh, solve the two domains independently because it's-, it's Yes, right. Mm. Uh, but if you use uh, Nietzsche, you yep. enforce this so you could solve both the problems in one shot, so to speak. Yes. yes. And uh, is there the, this condition enforced somehow uh, weakly? So, in the sense that, because this is the typical problem in which the, the statement of the problem is, is not correct, because they want to enforce at the same time the continuity of fluxes across the interface and the value of the, this particular sense temperature. Okay. And of course, if we use nature, we can satisfy everybody in the sense yes, that yes. Uh, it's uh, somehow enforcing both conditions in the same time. But uh, uh, we are aware that mathematically it is not correct. But uh, what do you think about that? Because it's a very standard problem in geophysics that we are facing uh, sometimes. Well, uh, I think if you're saying that the solution has a certain value and then you're saying that the fluxes should be continuous, I think that's pretty weird. <laughs> but if the geophysicists are happy with your solution, I, I mean, sometimes you, you find that the applied people are very happy when you, when you solve a problem that they think is a problem and they don't realize that it actually is no solution in a mathematical sense, but. Yeah. It is good to hear that because I had exactly the same reaction yeah. <laughs> that was asking me to solve it. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a, and then uh, I, I have a, another question, which I, I assume that uh, it can be more or less provocative because, uh, of course, if you are using Nietzsche, it's because you don't like uh, penalty methods. Yep. And um, but when I, I see this quasi uh, formulation. So my first thought is, okay, cohesive can be in penetration or in uh, separation. So you, you, you mentioned that uh, you avoid uh, penetration. So you put a, a strong, say, a contact condition. Yep. But in, if this alpha, small alpha uh, parameter you, you, you are introducing for the, say, normal part of the cohesive uh, behavior changes uh, when the 
with the sign of the of the of the normal displacement yes would you somehow make a um, say consistent formulation for the cohesive uh, behavior and a, and a say a penalty formulation for the penetration that, that's something that you could accommodate. yeah that's something yeah that's something that you could do but uh, um, you have uh, some kind of switch from uh, from uh, separation to compression mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I haven't looked at that, but uh, I mean, as long as you know what the parameters are, you could use these parameters, I suppose. Uh, so, it, of course, um, it is nonlinear, but it is as, as non, even less nonlinear than, than the uh, using the contact uh, condition, right? Or no, the, I mean, yeah, the contact condition is already nonlinear, so it doesn't really matter to me. I cannot see. I cannot really see the problem in using these parameters in the initial method directly as it is, uh, but maybe there is, I dare not okay. promise anything. So we, we, we have a, a couple of new questions now in the chat. Uh, Ioannis uh, Tulopoulos uh, is asking, uh, he's uh, thanking you for the nice talk, and he's saying, for the problem of having different diffusion coefficients, trying to construct this mean value interface term do we need to impose uh, some additional regularity for the fluxes across the interface? No, I mean, no, not that I can come up with directly. And also, if you use this hybrid method, you don't really have to create any. I mean, I think that's the nice thing about the hybrid method. You don't really have to think about min values anymore. There, there, there are no min values. You have one side, you have some intermediate uh, variable, and then you have the other side. So everything lives on its own side, and they only communicate via this intermediate variable, which I think could be uh, an advantage, actually, even though you have to pay to solve for this intermediate value uh, variable. I think sometimes it's pretty nice. I. I will return to this in a later paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another question from uh, Ruben Sevilla again. Uh, why do you use mainly simplicial elements? Is it a matter of the theoretical analysis being more complex for non simplicial elements? No, or is it a matter no. of computational complexity. No, the, the thing is that the only thing that actually matters here is that I if I use cut finite elements, I the simple thing is to do a straight cut. If you want to do a curved cut, well, then you have to invest a lot of energy into programming because it's a lot more difficult to do curved cuts. And you need to do curved cuts if you have high order elements. I think it does not matter for linears or bilinears. So I could use bilinears, of course. But okay. if I want to go to higher order methods, and I have curved interfaces, then I have to take that into account. So I've done cut finite elements for plates where I used cubic splines, and then I had to do a spline boundary. As we, we can't use a piecewise uh, straight line boundary. That's okay. So, but this, this uh, appears the same as, as when you use uh, either non simplicial or high order elements, uh, triangles. Yes, yes. I, I was thinking, yes, yeah, simplicial has nothing to do with it. No, no, no. I could use uh, any kind. So it's it's okay. more of a linear yeah. character for the, for, uh, as uh, Ruben said, uh, for the complex, computational complexity rather than. than yeah. I like simplicial elements because I, I make my own meshes. So. <laughs> But if you have cut finite elements, on the other hand, then you can actually just do a, a finite difference grid, which I think is pretty nice, and then you can cut it. So why not use uh, hexahedral elements? Why not? The only thing is that it's easy to refine a simplicial meth. You don't mesh. You don't have to use hanging nodes and so on. So yeah. Exactly. And all the intersections and all. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh... Thank you. I mean, I believe that there is no further question now. Uh, I believe everybody agrees that uh, this was an excellent uh, talk, an excellent lecture. Thank you, Peter, again. Thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting me. for having you today here. Too bad that uh, we couldn't meet in, in Göteborg, uh, but uh, next yeah. time uh, we, we can see each other. Next Thank time. you very much, uh, Peter. Thank you. Bye-bye.